Thank you, Mari, and thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I hope you had a good time at the party last night. My name is Kyle. I am based in Los Angeles, near the Los Angeles River, and I came to the arts through music and code originally. I've spent a lot of time working with new technologies like machine learning and computer vision. And for me, art takes a lot of different shapes. So sometimes it means building these mind-bending, uh, immersive installations with disco balls and structured light techniques from computer vision, or creating conceptual, uh, sculptural interventions aimed at repairing the ecological fallout from the NFT bubble, or exploring AI from sound design to interaction design, from robotics to dance, or building games that build collective resistance to surveillance. Uh, this one encourages players to kind of trick the AI into seeing them as something that they're not. And sometimes I explore AI in the context of installation and performance, asking questions like, what aspects of human com communication will never really be understood by machines? I also have a consulting side of my practice through my studio, Io Io, and sometimes we work for other artists like S. Devlin. Uh, we spent two, over two years building a generative poetry algorithm for her poetry pavilion at the 2020 World Expo. And the poetry responded to the visitors in the space and covered the facade. My studio, Io Io, also built a system for tracking fencers in real time at 60 frames per second with 24 cameras and a 24 GPU cluster. Uh, this system has been used in multiple competitions, including the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo, where it was integrated to a real-time augmented reality playback system, and this was built for Rhizomatics. But today, I want to talk about the ocean. I'm going to start with humpback whales and focus on Polynesian navigation. Back in the 1960s, commercial whaling was pushing many ocean species towards extinction. There were less than 10% of humpback whales uh, remaining. And in that moment, something kind of incredible happened. There is this United States Navy engineer in Bermuda named Frank Watlington. That's him in the front on the left there. And uh, he'd been assigned to make underwater recordings of dynamite explosion tests. And as he was working, sometimes he noticed these really haunting sounds in the background of the tapes. So he spent years making his own recordings in secret. Then in 1967, two friends came to visit for some whale watching, and he played the tapes for them. He said, I think these sounds might be humpback whales. And this was a huge surprise, because it wasn't common knowledge at the time that humpbacks could sing. This interaction led to what's arguably one of the greatest cultural interventions of all time. Frank's friends were the researchers Katie Payne and Roger Payne. And they went on to press the songs to vinyl as the best-selling album, Songs of the Humpback Whale. Their goal was to weave humpback songs into human culture, and by doing that, kind of reorient our relationship with these creatures. And it was massively successful. This album inspired huge collective action, and there were regulatory changes, and today, uh, humpbacks are back to about 90% of what they were pre-whaling. Uh, and there was uh, a lot of kind of careful research from Katie in particular that helped us appreciate the complexity of humpback musical culture. Other species haven't been quite as successful as the humpback. So right now, there are only around 300 North Atlantic right whales remaining, which mostly go kind of swimming along the east coast of uh, North America. One of the main dangers that North Atlantic right whales and other cetaceans face today is marine debris. And this is basically leftover fishing gear that's kind of floating around and getting caught on whales. So if, when it gets caught, it, it's really brutal. It cuts through their skin and it slowly digs into their bones. And fishing gear will kill around 300,000 whales and dolphins every year. While we're waiting on regulatory changes to reduce fishing gear debris, 
Uh, some organizations are taking direct action. This is the Center for Coastal Studies in Cape Cod, and they do a lot of stuff. They, they dredge up leftover gear, they take care of uh, you know, animals that are caught, and they remove uh, fishing gear from whales, basically, before it kills them. So I've been working with composer Annie Lewandowski to create these audiovisual installations that incorporate the fishing gear recovered from Center for Coastal Studies, and uh, 50 years after that first album, um, Annie has actually been working with Katie Payne to make new humpback recordings. And Annie and I wanted to kind of help shift awareness of the ocean, maybe in the same way that first album did. Uh, though I don't know if uh, interactive installation will ever be as big as a vinyl record. <laughs> I created this lighting design using machine learning that kind of draws your eyes and ears to focus on the really complex patterns within the humpback songs that can be sort of hard to pick up on a first listen. Normally it takes hours and hours of listening to humpback music. Katie was, like I said, the first person to realize that humpback songs have this recursive structure, kind of like classical music. Notes will repeat to build a phrase, and phrases repeat to build a theme, and themes repeat to build a song. A song session, which can include multiple songs, sometimes lasts about 20 minutes until they have to go back to the surface and catch their breath again. Some bioacoustics researchers describe this recursive structure using transition diagrams, uh, but Annie and I are trying to take these ideas a step further using machine learning to reveal some of the more complex nuance behind humpback songs. So we built a system for automatically converting humpback songs into lighting design so that visitors can pick up the patterns faster than if they're only listening. And my hope with these visualizations is to not simply produce beautiful images or lighting, um, I, and I'm not just interested in communicating more information. I, I'm not interested in like answering a question or making a judgment. I'm more interested in building an intuitive connection rather than an academic understanding. You know, I want to kind of explore in concert with machine intelligence in a way that allows us to listen more deeply to our more than human relatives. I think there's a lot of space for artists and other creative people to work with new tech in a way that reorients and reconnects us. So let's talk about sailing. How many people have been sailing? Oh, I'd love to see it. <laughs> so when I was 13, I sailed small boats for a few years, almost uh, 20 years off the water, living in uh, New York and some places in upstate New York for school. Um, I moved back to Los Angeles in Southern California and I started sailing again. Uh, and I kind of felt the whole world open up to me in a way that it had never before. I think after decades in front of my computer screen, I could feel there was this important connection missing in my life. And around that time, I read this excerpt uh, from Native American lawyer, author, teacher, and activist, uh, Sherry Mitchell. She wrote, when we are physically sick, we consciously seek out the source of our healing. Our spirits do the same. When there is illness or imbalance within the spirit, it moves towards the source of its healing. When the newcomers came to this land, they believed that they were here to conquer new lands. What they didn't realize is that they'd been drawn here by spirit to seek healing from the illusion of separation that they'd been operating under. When I picked up sailing again, it was the only thing that I talked about with anyone for a while, to the point where my friends got kind of annoyed. <laughs> and one day I was talking with a friend from Guam, and she told me something that kind of blew my mind. She said, 
Uh, you know, some of the navigators from the Pacific, they always know where they are, even if they're blindfolded. You can put them in a canoe, they'll lay on their back, and just from feeling the movement of the rolling of the boat, they know where they are. And uh, this photo here shows one kind of teaching aid that's used in the Marshall Islands to communicate this knowledge about how swell patterns translate to location. Um, it's made of organic materials like plants and shells, and sometimes it's called a stick chart. So I tried to find more information beyond these charts, which rarely had any kind of details associated with them. And I found this incredible paper from Dr. Marianne George, who also goes by Mimi. Mimi is a cultural anthropologist based in Hawaii who's been working with navigators uh, from the island of Taumako in Solomon Islands since 1993. And in this paper, uh, Polynesian Navigation in Telapa, Mimi describes different aspects of this navigation system called Te Nohoanga Te Matangi, which translates as the wind positioning system or the seat of the wind. This system includes principles of swell navigation and reflection, uh, swell refraction, the way swells travel through island change and change, uh, the way swells travel through island chains and change, uh, and complex patterns of swell fences, which, are, uh, which include pathways that form between islands, as well as navigation based on the wind, uh, stars, and other signs, including this flash of light called Te Lapa. Learning about Te Lapa left me awestruck. Uh, te Lapa is this quick flash of light that shoots from islands and reefs up to 150 miles away. It appears to travel from the horizon to the viewer over the water surface in less than half a second. It has a beginning and an end. It doesn't just turn on and off all at once. And while it broadly follows a straight line from the horizon, sometimes it's uh, f described as like a roll of film on its side, you know, kind of meandering slightly. Sometimes it appears wider, sometimes more narrow, and typically it appears as white. Uh, sometimes it's a little kind of color tinted off-white. Different islands have consistent but different characteristics to their telapa, and it's typically very dim. Most of the time, it's more faint than bioluminescence, but very rarely it's as bright as a camera flash. Uh, telapa can appear anywhere from a handful of times per night to multiple times per hour, and it's unrelated to the weather or seasons or to visibility of the stars or moon though sometimes it's difficult to see under a full moon, and in really heavy seas or very calm seas, it can be uh, also hard to see, but it's visible throughout the Pacific. Mimi's mentor was Paramount Chief Coloso Kavea, an exceptionally accomplished navigator and leader from Taumako. To see Te Lapa, Kavea taught that a navigator should stare intently in the direction that they expect to see it. And when they don't see it, they should look about 20 degrees to the side, kind of testing each angle. And this is necessary because Te Lapa, most of the time, it's way too faint to catch our peripheral vision. Kavea theorized that Te Lapa may be related to swell patterns, and specifically to the intersecting nodes of swell interference patterns when they uh, move around an island and then on the other side kind of make this shape, each of those intersections, maybe it's related to that somehow because those radiate away from the island. And there's a handful of other theories, you know, maybe it's connected to volcanic activity or maybe an island is like a battery with a freshwater lens surrounded by salt water or maybe there's, you know, undiscovered kinds of bioluminescence or mechanoluminescence or electroluminescence. Uh, some theories are kind of non-starters, like Telapa moves way faster than any animal over that distance, um, but no one really knows what it is. Or I should say there's no clear physical explanation, because in Taumako they do know what it is. Telapa is usually understood as an ancestor or a message from the ancestors. It, it appears most frequently in times of danger and uncertainty, to provide direction and consolation. And like other natural signs, navigators build up a relationship with Te Lapa where they read and understand and trust it and it provides for them when they need it. There's a spiritual side to this that I'm only just discovering. 
learning about Telapa kind of opened a rift in the fabric of reality for me. It's this mysterious phenomena, unknown to science, but it's reliable enough that sailors have used it for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. And at the end of Mimi's paper, she wrote, you know, Telapa has never been captured on camera. <laughs> but a video could be a helpful teaching tool, and it should be possible to capture with the right low-light sensor. So I kind of realized in that moment, like, my hyper-rational worldview had been protecting me from the profound weirdness of reality. So I immediately just wrote Mimi a cold email, and I asked if there might be a place for me, this weird artist who knows a bit about cameras, to work with her on this. And she said, yes, and we met in Hawaii. That's her going uh, <laughs> paddling in, uh, on Kauai. Mimi introduced me to her collaborator in Solomon Islands, Luke Vaikawi. He grew up on Talmako, and uh, Luke is a former captain of the Marine Police patrol boats for Solomon Islands, uh, including mainly working in fisheries enforcement. He's been leading efforts to perpetuate voyaging culture on Talmako Island, which includes rebuilding relationships across his province. And we all kind of got together and drafted up proposals and budgets, and after about a year of applying for grants, we finally received some funding. So I got kind of into the weeds, and I researched, and I did my stuff. I built like this special camera that might be one of the most sensitive low-light cameras on the planet. Um, it's like competitive or better than most uh, um, kind of uh, night vision sensors. Uh, we worked with experts to remove the infrared and the UV filters from a Sony A7S III, and we also removed the Bayer grid, which, like, you shouldn't, I do not recommend. <laughs> uh, we turned it into this, like, ultra-sensitive black-and-white camera with a f.95 lens, shooting at 400,000 ISO, 25th of a second exposure, 24 frames per second, into this ProRes RAW recorder, like, all the light we could get, every photon we could, was converted into an electron and turned into a digital pixel. We tested this gimbal system to kind of keep the camera steady while it's on the boat, and uh, we worked with Daniel Jackson from Arcteryx to design this custom kind of camera splash bag that was very lightweight and also very water resistant. So here we are, we're like ready to go. We got all the tech together, right? Ready to sail to the Solomon Islands and hit record. Uh, then COVID happened. <laughs> I realized this was going to take some time. Uh, what I didn't realize yet was that beyond just COVID, uh, anything that involves the ocean is contingent on endless conditions, from unpredictable weather to complex international and local regulations. Mimi once wrote that early navigators waited for fair winds to make their voyages and made themselves useful and happy in other locations. <laughs> and that's what I did. So. I found other ways to make myself useful. Mimi had been working with folks in Taumako to make two award-winning documentaries called We the Voyagers. And so I got back in, and I did my research, and uh, when all the film festivals went research, we built out this infrastructure to support like a multilingual translation effort and get all the films online. I, w I was kind of surprised jumping into this because I thought I'd just be working on camera stuff, and I really quickly realized that the things I know how to do were useful in a lot of ways I hadn't expected. I also came back to what Kavea said, that Telapa was related to swell patterns. So I started coding simulations of idealized swell refraction. I learned to work with ocean depth data, and I simulated swells in different parts of the Pacific at different times of the year. I started to study satellite imagery and the way swells appear in in those situations. I learned how to extract swell patterns from that satellite imagery. Um, I learned to sail bigger boats and how to fly drones offshore so I could document swells from multiple perspectives. This is me um, almost losing my eyes. <laughs> The more I learned about the ocean from the perspective of Pacific Islanders, the more I realized how poorly the Pacific is represented in our maps. It's digitized in this way that treats it as completely empty. So on the left is a Los Angeles electronics store with <laughs> every shopping aisle mapped out. And on the right is the remote island of Anuta, which is near Tamako and has similar culture. It's about six times wider than the electronics store and has 300 people who have been living on it for a few thousand years, maybe, a thousand years. Uh, 
sorry, for a thousand years. Uh, Google doesn't even map it, it's just blue. <laughs> but the ocean's far from featureless. You know, the Pacific is seen by outsiders as these small disconnected islands, if you even know that there are any islands there. But this is a result of a kind of 19th century imperialism uh, that involves a lot of uh, kind of colonial and missionary policies. There was this incredible Fijian writer, Epeli Haofa, who says, if our countries are small, poor, and isolated, then it's only true insofar as our people are still fenced in and quarantined. For Pacific peoples, the ocean is a highway and a connective tissue. The ocean's full of complexity. We can see the ocean for its currents. We can see it for the ocean temperature, the way it flows and moves, or the migration of birds and the routes they follow. There's the shared language families and cultural connections across the Pacific, with most islands speaking an Austronesian language. And in these connections, we can also trace the history of the Pacific. For example, the sweet potato is native to South America, but Pacific voyagers spread it all across the ocean. And they even, one of the reasons we know is they even kept the same name, Kumara, for, uh, from, taken from indigenous peoples around Peru and Ecuador. When Europeans first met Pacific Islanders, they assumed that the Pacific must have been settled by accidental voyages. They were, they were even kind of very dangerously uninformed adventurers like this guy, Thor Heyerdahl, who took these really unsafe trips in an attempt to prove that the Pacific had been settled by South Americans making accidental voyages. And versions of this drift theory persisted until the late 60s when there was this New Zealand raised sailor named David Lewis who decided, I'm just gonna go out and ask them how they settled the Pacific. <laughs> he asked them about their navigation techniques and his writings helped create awareness for tra traditional navigation techniques outside of the Pacific. Today we have a much better picture of how voyaging culture spread starting from Taiwan over 3,000 years ago to eventually cover a massive range all the way from Madagascar in the west to Peru in the east, and from New Zealand in the south to Hawaii in the north. But to Google Maps, the ocean's just this undifferentiated blue. It's an uninterpretable. And I wonder if this uninterpretability is part of the reason that outsiders could only imagine the Pacific being settled by drifting. It's hard to know, where would you go? How would you get there? The boats seem uninterpretable too, but like the ocean, these boats are also nuanced and technologically advanced. This is Tepuke, which is a type of boat from Tamako. If you kind of glance at the boat quickly, you might think, oh, it's a catamaran, it has two hulls. There's one on the left, one on the right. But unlike a catamaran or any monohull, this boat can sail both forwards and backwards. And this is a key feature of a uh, category of boats called proa that are common in the Pacific. And these boats are usually characterized by their long, skinny, canoe-like hulls with a smaller hull to one side called the outrigger. And the outrigger is used for balance. You know, it kind of weighs that side of the boat down and it keeps it from sinking as well. Uh, sometimes this balance is understood metaphorically in Pacific culture with each hull being a kind of necessary part of the boat, but neither of them being sufficient alone to balance the boat. And when Captain Cook, uh, an infamously violent British explorer, first met Pacific peoples, his 100-foot European tall ship was described as a boat without an outrigger. When the crab claw-shaped sail was studied by aerodynamics researchers over the last 50 years, they found that it actually has a better performance at most points of sail than a f the more familiar to us Western sail called a Bermuda rig, which is that kind of typical triangle shape that you see on boats. Um, cra these crab claw sails take advantage of something called vortex lift, which is a principle that's only been used in jets over the last maybe 60 years. Uh, and when the hull of a tepuke is studied closely, you can see there's these kind of finely scalloped uh, textures, there's other technologies at play. Um, you might think, oh, they just didn't want to sand it down or it took too long, they just left the, uh, you know, they left the results of their ads uh, incomplete, but actually the scalloped surface creates a boundary layer in the water that reduces the drag of the hull of the boat. 
this, the hull for Tepuque is mostly submarine, which also reduces drag uh, by minimizing the wave-making resistance on the hull of the boat. And this design can really only be found in some advanced Navy vessels called small water plane area twin hull vehicles, or SWADs. So to the untrained eye, a Pacific sailing vessel might appear you know, kind of archaic and makeshift and unsophisticated. And as outsiders, we're more familiar with steel, fiberglass, sanded wood, plastic. Uh, but if you look a little closer, these boats embody a really complex set of advanced techniques from the aerodynamics and the hydrodynamics to sustainable manufacturing, accompanied by this philosophy of robust repairability, which demonstrates their incredible technological achievements. Finally, after a year and a half of kind of studying from home, trying to make myself useful, uh, barely scraping the surface, there was this opening in the pandemic, and I took the camera to Kauai, and we sailed from Hanalei Bay west to Ni'ihau. Due to the pandemic, uh, Luke wasn't able to leave Solomon Islands yet, so we treated this as more of an equipment test, since we couldn't all be there to really have his expert knowledge. As the sun set, I set up the camera for recording, and once it was completely dark, I was speaking with Mimi about the logistics for the night, and I noticed just over her shoulder there was this flash on the water. And I wasn't sure exactly what I saw, but I hit record and I sat down with Mimi to watch for a while. We kind of alternated looking towards Ni'ihau to the west and the Hawaiian Islands to the rest of the Hawaiian island chain to the northwest. And when I finally saw it, I was really unsure whether I was seeing something real. And as time passes, it even feels hard to believe and trust in my own experience. But I remember in that moment, I was able to confirm by talking with Mimi. Uh, there'd be a flash, and I'd say, did you see that? And she'd say, yeah, it came from over there. And I'd say, yeah, it was from over there. And it kind of broke up a little bit in the middle, maybe two thirds from the top. And she'd say, yeah, and then she described something else about it, like its color or kind of its width or something. And it felt like learning to trust my senses again. You know, we were operating at the very bounds of my sense of perception, at least. Um, and it felt like, uh, I don't know, I'm learning to reject this kind of anti-relational concept of objectivity. It was like learning to accept the subjectivity experience again and sharing that subjectivity with someone else. I guess the thing I've been learning is that most of my life, my perception has mostly operated within a very limited, bounded box. Uh, and when I learn how to expand that box, the whole world opens up full of new relationships. When we reviewed the footage around the times that we believed we saw Telapa, there was nothing. <laughs> and I realized <laughs> the camera had actually been drifting across the horizon. <laughs> And the timestamps I wrote down were way too imprecise to see it anyway, on the order of minutes instead of seconds. So for the next round of tests, we sailed 25 miles west from Kona on Hawaii Island. We kind of iterated on the camera mount. I figured out how to keep it locked better. And this time I brought a dog clicker, one of those you know, training clickers, so I could kind of track sightings more clearly from the audio track. Every time we'd see it, you'd get a click, and I could look at the audio for the click. And we believed we saw Telapa kind of coming from Maui, but again, when we checked the footage, there was nothing but these hints of bioluminescence in the water. And I don't know, maybe the flash was just too faint to make it through the noise. For our next trip, we finally met with Luke in Fiji. Uh, we felt like the equipment was sort of ready, even if we hadn't caught Telapa yet. Uh, Fiji is a kind of midpoint between Hawaii and Solomon Islands. That was one of the easiest places for us to all get together. And that's where we correct, connected with Seta Rakilandua. Seta is a sailor and a navigator from a long line of boat builders who focused uh, on a type of boat called Ndrua. Seta is the captain of Ivola Singovo, which is the only remaining sailing Drua. All the other Drua are in museums. And in Fiji, we kind of waited out some stormy nights and then finally sailed east from Leleuvia Island on Ivola Singovo. I built out like a new mount for the camera that could attach to the Drua more easily. And it, it felt like a metaphor for the entire project. Like how do you connect the fibers of traditional tech to the extruded aluminum of industrial tech? And a Drua, is, like most traditional boats, is held together with lots of lashings, kind of small ropes that are tied together many times 
So we did that. We lashed the camera to the rig as well with Velcro. <laughs> this is the lens getting impossibly foggy in the humid rain. <laughs> We looked to the east for Telapa, coming from any of the dozens of islands within a 150-mile radius, and we sat on the reef for a few nights, and we never saw Telapa this time. Instead, we spent kind of quiet evenings sharing stories and dreams while some of us rested and others looked out over the water. Our most recent attempt at capturing Te Lapa happened on a very different vessel. A few years ago, the Solomon Islands Maritime Safety Authority decided that traditional sailboats were unsafe without an escort vessel, in spite of having been sailed for thousands of years. In response, Luke and Mimi have been working to acquire an, ex uh, an escort vessel for Tamako. They worked with a family of boat builders on Hawaii Island to design and build a proa, but built with modern materials. So it was a kind of experiment in building, uh, bringing two traditions together. The boat is named SV Lata, uh, after a hero from Tamako culture. I worked on and slept on Lata for more than a month, and we learned how to sail a boat that no one had ever sailed before and prepared to deliver it to Tamako. And so on that three-week trip, uh, we would try to capture Telapa from this boat in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, I tried to document this time like what I was learning in real time because uh, it, I was sort of reoriented from just this technical problem and pedagogical problem of how we kind of capture and share Telapa to a completely different problem of how do we make this boat ready to live on as like our space station for the next three weeks. And I learned a lot. I learned that a boat is a traveling hardware store because it needs to be equipped with the means to repair itself. I learned that every tool has a lanyard that you attach to your arm because the ocean is a trickster and it will take everything from you. <laughs> I learned that knowledge is embodied in physical objects instead of being abstracted away into theories. You know, you see not this written on a piece of wood. Sometimes this knowledge is about regulations because boats exist in a liminal space between legal boundaries where our social intuitions sometimes break down. I learned to understand rope from a new perspective. Now I see it as this kind of impedance matcher, somewhere between organic and inorganic, uh, the rigid and the dynamic. I see it as this site of negotiation between crew members with kind of rules and style guidelines for interfacing with it, coiling it, tying it. Uh, enforcing harmony on the boat, just like a code base ha might have style guide. And SV Lata has uh, an engine in it. It's not just a sailboat. Most sailboats aren't just sailboats. The engine is a kind of messy abomination and an absolute necessity. I learned that sometimes the promise of freedom and safety that an engine provides can turn into another point of failure and become a liability. After many sea trials, we set off on the first leg of our voyage, and over two, just over two hours after sunset, part of the engine melted. Until we have a new vessel to sail, we're keeping the experimental camera in storage, and we're focusing on the storytelling. There's kind of other ways to build pedagogical tools and visibility for Tamako culture. I've been coding new simulations of Telapa and working with people who have seen it to recreate what they saw, doing a kind of inverse photography or making video from memory. And we're working on a new project to present some of the principles of Te Nohonga Te Matangi, the navigation system, in this interactive website. Okay, to wrap up, I want to take us back to Fiji, to one of those nights where we were waiting for Te Lapa in the rain <laughs> with the foggy camera lens. One of the things we were talking about is what it would mean to capture Te Lapa. You know, we thought back to where this project started. In 1993, that was when Paramount Chief Colosa Kavea met Mimi on a visit to Tamako with the New Zealand, New Zealand raised navigator that I mentioned earlier, David Lewis, who wrote that book, We the Navigators. Uh, Kavea understood the significance of perpetuating their traditions and creating visibility for their people and their culture in the face of an encroaching Western influence. Kavea asked Mimi to help document and share their traditions throughout the Pacific and to the world. And Mimi has been working with people from Tamako ever since. 
And we talked about this origin while we were sitting there on the water and about the way telapa only seems to appear when it's needed. And we wondered, maybe is it not yet the right time for it to be documented? Or maybe in the face of climate change, you know, it's exactly the right time for a broad return to understanding the primacy of the ocean within the ecosystem of the Earth. And we just had to do a little more work to receive it properly. I think about something that Katie Payne, the whale bioacoustics researcher, Annie and I were working with for our siren project, uh, had said about humpback whales. She said, that the activist slogan was save the whales, but actually the whales saved themselves. <laughs> when I spend time on the ocean, I think about the way it's heating up, acidifying, filling with plastic, and I wanna help save the ocean, but I suspect it will also ultimately be the one that saves itself. This is my first time speaking about this work ever, uh, and whenever I share something the first time, it's hard to tell a linear story, but in this case, it's been especially hard because the story is that every single thing turns out to be connected to every other thing. There's no more lines, no space for individualism or separation. I'm finding myself wrapped up in this web of relationships. And I've been thinking about this one street in the town I grew up in. It's covered with eucalyptus trees. And just before a storm, the smell on that street was overwhelming. When I was a kid, I knew there were waves at the beach, I knew when they were big. I knew when the jellyfish were swimming. I knew how to kind of shuffle my feet to warn the stingrays. Um, but as an adult, I find myself losing a lot of these relationships in a very urban built environment. Sometimes navigation systems uh, are separated into self-centered and home-centered reference systems. Using a compass is self-centered. Every direction is relative to where you stand. Home-centered means knowing where you are now by always keeping track of the way back home. In all this work, I'm literally learning how to reorient myself, to stop seeing myself at the center of a compass, and even kind of stop seeing home as a 2D place on a map of space. I'm learning to have an expanded concept of home where I'm a full participant in a complex ecosystem, teeming with life and relationships and mysteries beyond anything I ever imagined. If you'd like to contribute to the work of Luke, Mimi, and Seta, you can donate or learn more at holao.org, vaca.org, and Seta is available on Facebook. And I'm also very happy to make introductions. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>